All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. We're going to get started. Tony, can we take the roll? Jimenez? Jimenez? Torres? Cohen? Here. Ortiz? Present. Davis? Duan? Present. Candelas? Foley? Here. Batra? Kame? Here. Mayhan? Here. I'm going to go back because several people walked in. Jimenez, Torres, Davis, Here. Candelas. Present. Kame. Here. You have a quorum. Great. Now, if you're able, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great. Today's invocation will be given by Rose Amador Lebeau of Conexion to Community. And Councilmember Duan will tell us more. Thank you, Mayor. Rose Siwapili Amador from Conexion. Uh, she will do our invocation for today and will be celebrated uh, with all of us. Rose Siwapili Amador has been the President and Chief Executive Officer of Conexion to Community for the last 40 years. Conexion to Community is a highly respect respected organization in San Jose that provides a variety of services designed to create a new opportunity through culturally competent educational workforce development and social services. Ms. Amador is a co-founder of La Raza Roundtable and has represented the National Council of La Raza at the state and national level. Rose sits on a ver various community and civic board including Community Correction Partnership, Juvenile Justice System Collaborate, Reentry Network, the Chief of Police Community Advisory Board for the last four chiefs. She also served on the City of San Jose Work to Future Board of Director and President Clinton Initiative on Race and Poverty Task Force. Rose have produced and host a community television program, Native Voice TV, for over 
over 17 years. Please give a big welcome to Ms. Amador. Good afternoon, honorable mayor and city council members. I'm honored to represent Conexión to Community, a nonprofit that serves our diverse community through numerous programs that impact thousands of lives. With me today are a few staff members from Conexión. We have Joey Torres, just wait, Lori Chavez, Quasiwa Trinidad, Roland Metra. Quetzali Jimenez, and Josiah Dominguez, the Youth Ambassador for the Muwekma Ohlone Tribe. Our staff member, Joey Torres, is, is a descendant of the Muwekma Ohlone Tribe, the first people who occupied the land where City Hall sits and where we stand. He will share our sacred sage to bless the mayor and council with wisdom and love as they make decisions for our city, and we pray for the well-being of our community. We pray for all of our children, and we pray for the missing and murdered indigenous women. We are approaching Labor Day, and it would only be befitting to honor the people who toil in the hot sun to put food on the tables. Cesar Chavez's prayer of the farm worker struggle. Show me the suffering of the most miserable so I will know my people's plight. Free me to pray for others, for you are present in every person. Help me to take responsibility for my own life so that I can be free at last. Grant me courage to serve others, for in service there is true life. Give me honesty and patience so that I can work with other workers Bring forth song and celebration so that the spirit will be alive among us. Let the spirit flourish and grow so that we will never tire of the struggle. Let us remember those who have died for justice, for they have given us life. Help us to love even those who hate us so we can change the world. Omateo, thank you. Thank you, Rose, for those beautiful words and your service to our community. We are on to ceremonial items. Councilmember Foley and Councilmember Dewan, if you would join me at the podium, we will recognize disaster service workers. So I obviously have a huge group of people, and this isn't even all of the staff that would be involved in a disaster. Good afternoon, I'm Council Member Pam Foley and I represent Council District 9. I'm joined today by my fellow Council Member Bien Duan, who represents Council District 7. This afternoon's commendation recognizing our disaster service workers for their quick response to the January floods, experienced throughout the city, has been a long time in the making. I mean, it's almost September, right? Floods were in, well, earlier. This recognition, originally scheduled for March, was rescheduled due to the reactivation of our emergency evacuation centers due to the reoccurrence of another round of floods in March. So I'm glad that we're finally here today to recognize this group of individuals. The City of San Jose has a large group of employees from numerous departments who are called into action to aid in the response and recovery phases of a disaster 
or emergency. These individuals are known as our disaster service workers, but they all have other day jobs too. San Jose's disaster service workers work around the clock to ensure all residents, including those in our most vulnerable communities, are kept safe and provided with much needed services and resources in times of disasters and emergencies. Oftentimes, these individuals don't receive enough credit for all that they do to keep everyone's safety as their top priority when they step into this role time and time again. We also saw them activated for a long time during COVID. I can't possibly name all of the departments whose efforts keep us all safe and well informed about the weather and critical resources during times like the extreme weather we saw earlier in January and over the early months of 2023. But I'm gonna name just a few, so if I forget a few, I am deeply apologetic. Office of Emer Emergency Management, City Manager's Office, Department of Transportation, Public Works, Parks, Recreation and Neighborhood Services, Housing, and of course our Police and Fire Departments, and many, many other staff. In fact, what many of you don't realize is that when a disaster is declared, we're all activated to some level to respond to the disasters. Among those joining us today, we have the facility supervisor for Camden Community Center, Lisa Yarn. And the facility supervisor for Seven Trees Community Center, Avon Dewan. And their support staff here to recognize their response to quickly activate each of their locations earlier this year. These individuals work to keep one of our most critical resources, our emergency evacuation centers and warming centers open for 24 hours, multiple days in a row, in both January and March of this year alone. This group also worked tirelessly to make sure that the unhoused were evacuated from the creeks and flood banks that would have created a disaster for them. Mayor Mahan, there he is. Will you please do the honor of presenting the dedicated team with this commendation, and I invite PRNS Assistant Director Neil Rufino to say a few words. Where's Neil? Uh, thank you again, Mayor and Council. Uh, definitely on the behalf of the city employees, I'm thankful to be here representing uh, the mass care team uh, of the EOC. During the winter storms in January, we opened up evacuation centers at Seven Trees in Camden and expanded the uh, capacity at the Roosevelt Community Center. These centers were vital for many of our San Jose's most vulnerable. We've served over 300 individuals during these storms. I'd like to thank our other key partners including the American Red Cross, our housing department, uh, and especially our city hall security team, who uh, really helped us out and stood up on the first few days of the emergency. It was pretty hectic. Uh, but they came in and they really helped, uh, helped us out for all of our staff, as well as the residents um, for, for the shelters. Um, across these main activations, sites, we had over 142 city staff acted selflessly to make uh, a dangerous time safer and more comfortable for all of our residents. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, the city council for its continued involvement or investment in the Office of Emergency Management, whose support, leadership, and training has really elevated our ability as city employees to respond. So we'd like to thank our staff for all their work and everything that we've done today, and I believe we have a short video to show for the audience.
Before the crowd breaks up, I'd like to invite all of my council members down so we can take a picture with everybody. So we're going to have to squeeze in really close. All right, thanks again, everybody. We are on to our second ceremonial item, Councilmember Ortiz. If you join me at the podium, we will recognize and proclaim California Farm Worker Appreciation Day. Hello everybody. In 2021, with the passage of Senate Bill 721, uh, California designated August 26 as California Farm Worker Day to honor the many contributions of the state's farm workers to the state, country, and of course the world. For San Jose, California, Farm Workers Day serves as an opportunity to reflect on our own history and the people who continue to keep us nurtured. As many of us here know that before there was Silicon Valley, San Jose was a major agricultural hub known as the Valley of Heart's Delight. And how cool that Councilmember Torres and Davis, in collaboration with the Berryessa Flea Market Vendors Association, are paying homage to that history by hosting the Plaza Azul Farmers Market. Yes, round of applause. <laughs> Make sure Make sure everybody comes to enjoy the delicious fresh fruits and produce, produce during the weekly farmer's market just outside of the West Plaza every Tuesday at City Hall from 12 to 3 p.m. It's important for us to recognize that our economy was and continues to be fueled by the hard work of the Valley's farm workers, most of them Latino and Asian immigrants whose stories all too often went untold and unseen. For me, it's an incredible honor to represent the district where labor leaders, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, along with Filipino-American leaders, Larry Itleong and Philip Veracruz, and the Delano Manons catalyzed the farm worker movement and opened new pathways to organizing across racial and ethnic lines. And now the Mexican Heritage Plaza and Del Delano Manong Park stand as a testament to the struggle immortalizing the legacy of these incredible leaders. In short, the blood, sweat, and tears of California's farm workers is built into the foundation of San Jose. As exposed during the COVID-19 pandemic, the struggle for dignity on the job has not ended for our state's farm workers. Every summer, workers brave new record heats and face poor air quality from wildfires to provide of uh, food for their families and produce for the world. These conditions brought a new surge of organizing by farm workers for better pay and better working conditions. It's for that reason that I, along with the mayor, 
are proud to present this proclamation to Casimiro Alvarez of the United Farm Workers, the inheritors of Cesar's legacy who continue to advocate for the dignity of our state's farm workers. Since 1960, the United Farm Workers of America has stood as the nation's first enduring and largest farm workers union. The UFW continues its activism in major agri agricultural sectors, chiefly in California, and their work protects thousands of vegetable, berry, winery, tomato, and dairy workers in California, Oregon, and the state of Washington. I am proud, along with the mayor, to present this proclamation today and kindly invite Casimiro to share a few words. Yeah, thank you. Yes, of course. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you all the city members to pass this uh, proclamation on behalf of the farm workers. Uh, thank you so much uh, to city council member Peter Ortiz and all the city members who was part of this, le or of this proclamation. Uh, in behalf of the United Far Workers, uh, we want to thank uh, for this recognition, uh, honoring to the Far Workers. This is an appreciation that will be always remembered and shared with those workers who every day put our foods in the tables. People who need uh, the change, people who need help, people who have family, people who have values, people who work in a sector that may of us do not want to work. Gente trabajadora, but people who have a the more biggest profession in this country. For all that you do, thank you, and we appreciate all that you do for the farm workers. Thank you again for this recognition. All right, we are on to orders of the day. Does anyone on the council have any changes to the printed agenda? Okay, not seeing any. Move along to the closed session report. Thank you, Mayor. We do not have anything to report out of closed session today. Great, thank you, Nora. Okay, we're on to the consent calendar. And just before I turn to my colleagues, I wanna just Acknowledge, I want to thank the city clerk, and I know many of my colleagues, including the vice mayor, have been advocating for us to make sure that every possible way we are providing access and language accessibility to everyone. And so we now have comment cards in not just English, but also Spanish and Vietnamese. And so you'll see them at the boxes there. So thank you, Tony. And uh, if we have public comment today, you can find these cards at the boxes located on either side of the, uh, the seating here. So for the consent calendar, are there any items anyone on the council would like to pull for discussion? 
Okay, do we have a motion? Move approval of the consent. I would second. Okay. And do we have any public comment? Blair? All right, thank you. Blair Beekman here. Thanks a lot to Tony for working on the cards, the public comment cards. It's a really nice thing. Good luck on continuing efforts to define good practices of public accessibility in the public meeting process. Uh, I've got ideas and helpful ideas. I hope we can talk in the future about them more. Uh, I wanted to speak on item 2.15, strengthening mobility and revolutionizing uh, transportation program grant acceptance. You're getting uh, federal grant money to work on something called curb digitaliz digitization. Uh, it's a pilot project. Uh, good luck with this sort of program. And this is really part of the uh, smart city future things that, uh, you know, these sort of items uh, should be more than on consent, I think. I think these are the sort of items that need a full agenda item uh, discussion uh, for community understanding what we're moving into, the future we're moving into. Uh, this is about data collection issues. It can do a lot more, I think. It can offer, uh, you know, with uh, wheelchair services for people. Uh, it can help with, uh, you know, uh, micromobility issues, uh, scooter issues, and it can help with the future of AV issues. So, I mean, there's a lot involved here that really needs a real open public vetting, I think, and understanding. Um, Jim Ortball has done some incredible work with uh, data collection issues for, for scooter issues uh, and micromobility things that I think is really, uh, it'll be an important key in this process that I invite yourselves to check out uh, and look into if you're, if, you don't, if you're not already familiar with it. And that, um, boy, just uh, as always, just an openness and accountability with this subject matter to really help define, you know, it's important we find, uh, define a good civil protection ideals and practices with this sort of work and to want to make those sort of efforts really develops organizational skills of the mind in how to view these issues. And it does really important good stuff. So really want to check out uh, that sort of thinking that uh, it's important as we work, move into our future to be responsible and reflective. Thank you. Paul. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I'd like to draw the council's attention to the law. I mean, I, I didn't write it. You guys wrote it. You guys approved it. It's the law, and it's a it's a city ordinance. It's a city charter issue. All of those things wrapped up. Any item that goes on consent calendar that is over one million dollars necessarily needs to be agendized. And so, I, it, it, this is going on like way too long. And you think that by your silence and just ignoring what I'm saying, that somehow or another, uh, that means that what I'm saying is wrong and not valid. We're talking about breaking the law here. And the reason why that law, I assume, is put in place is because anything over $1 million of taxpayer money needs to be accounted for. Because this isn't your money just to determine that you could send anywhere you want. And if we just put it on consent, well, then nobody, we're not going to discuss it. And we'll just vote on it, second it, and then move it. And then next item, and then and nobody's the wiser. That's the reason why that law, and it's a law that is put in place. It's not just like an ordinance, it's a law. And the reason why that law is in place is to prevent corruption. Now, every single time that you're voting on an item that is going through consent that has the dollar amount above a million dollars, you're in violation of the law. Every city council member that votes on it is in direct violation of the law. So we don't have time to take you through the courts on every single one of those issues. So I'm just asking you and your staff, do your reading, because I do, and I'm kind of tired of educating you on something that you should be doing already. Caller 6910. Well, I think it's great that we finally have comment cards in three languages in uh, nearly 2024. I need to point out the closed captioning. When, you, when you're when you following along in the closed captioning, it's just pathetic. 
it is really disrespectful to the close to the Sean, disabled this, community. That's that more related along. to this is an open forum item that you're talking about. We're on consent calendar. Do you have any comments about consent calendar? When I'm trying to read the consent calendar and to follow along with what's being said, I have a very hard time when I'm following along with the closed captioning. So there are things that mangle the conversation and change the course of the conversation based on what's being written. And it's very hard to follow along because the words don't even make sense. For instance, earlier, the word city was not even a word that I could even understand. It was like subble. It, it had six letters and it wasn't even city, it said four letters. And so if you can't even type out city correctly, then how are people supposed to be able to follow along with anything? So I'm asking you to please get some closed captioning that is actually much more correct for the people in the disabled community. If you want this to be inclusive of everybody, please include the whole disabled community so we can follow along and be part of this in a real true way uh, so that we can read, the, read this and understand. Earlier in the conversation, when it was city, it was actually spelled Sidbury, S-I-D-B-U-R-Y, instead of city. Um, and that is just shameful and disrespectful. Back to council. Great, thank you, Tony. I also do just want to clarify for the public record that it is our general policy that items in value of two million or more come to the council as a full item for discussion, though even that is at the discretion of the Rules Committee. So just want everybody to be clear on, on how we handle that. Um, okay, so we are on to a vote on the motion on the floor, which is to adopt the consent calendar. It's, hold on, it's, I'm going to try again. It says sign it needs to be stopped. Okay, we, there we there go. There it is. motion passes unanimously thank you tony all right we're going to do the report of the city manager thank you mayor i have no report today great thank you okay on to item 3.3 proposed revisions to the revolving door policy and we do have a staff presentation so we'll start as you all are ready Thank you, Mayor. I will just take a moment. Um, this uh, matter was deferred back in May to August, um, and uh, Matthew Tolme from my office and Joe Royce, the city auditor, um, will be walking the council through a short presentation. Thank you, Nora. Uh, Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council members. Uh, as Nora mentioned, my name is Matthew Tolman. I'm one of the deputy city attorneys here in the office. And one of the assignments I have involves representing the Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices. The item that we've got before us today is for 3.3. Can you please speak into the mic? It's really muffled on this side. Thank you. Does that sound better? OK, perfect. So item 3.3 that we have today, it involves recommendations that come from the Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices. I'm probably gonna refer to them as the board or the BFCPP, just to simplify things. Uh, one of these items involves changes to Title 12, and there are a number of changes. As Nora mentioned, these were previously placed on the agenda for the May 23rd City Council meeting. Prior to the May 23rd City Council meeting, there was a memorandum that was drafted by Council Members Cohen and Council Members Jimenez, which proposed a alternative recommendation for just one of the items that was recommended by the BFCPP, and that focuses on the revolving door issue. I'll get into that in a second. So beyond that revolving door issue, there are other Title 12 recommendations that came from the BFCPP. And the final item, which is item three on the agenda for today, are recommendations to update resolution 79187. That resolution currently holds 
the BFCPP's regulations and policies and procedures. Uh, to give you some background on this board, typically the BFCPP deals with alleged violations to certain Title 12 issues, but beyond that, they also investigate all of the city's campaign regulations, policies, and procedures. They typically do that in off-cycle years off of election dates so that they don't affect election years or make changes during election years. Most recently, they've done that twice, 2020, and then most recently again in 2023. In 2020, there were a number of recommendations, many of which are part of these ordinances or the resolution today, that were presented to the Rules Committee, approved by rules, and set to be heard during the Mayor's Biannual Ethics Review in 2020. However, during COVID, that did not occur. Those same recommendations got carried over to the more recent review from the BFCPP, and uh, they again were presented to rules earlier this year, set for the May agenda, and then deferred after the May agenda to this hearing. This slide focuses on one of the issues that we've separated for today. Um, this is the second item. It's the nonprofit exemption to the revolving door policy. Can you hear me again? Um, there was a city auditor's report that was completed in 2017 that took a look at our revolving door policy and the nonprofit exemption. As a result of the report that was authored by the city auditor, there were two recommendations. One of them was to mirror the definition of nonprofit organizations to the same definition under the lobbyist portion of our code, or it was to strike the nonprofit exemption altogether. After that report was provided by the city auditor, it was referred to the board, the BFCPP, for their recommendation. Following the BFCPP's review, the recommendation that came out of that board was to strike the nonprofit exemption entirely. That was included in our draft in the uh, Title 12 proposed ordinance that was placed on the May 23rd agenda. But as a result of the alternative proposal, we've separated that issue out for today. Um, the alternative recommendation that's come from council members Cohen and Jimenez would change the definition of a nonprofit organization to just 501c3 organizations, and they would be exempt whether they received money from the city in the previous five years or did not, and it would also change the prohibition period, which currently sits at two years to one year. So that's one of the issues that pops up. The other uh, changes to Title 12, which are presented in the first item that's presented under 3.3, there are four changes in that one. One of those is a change to the amount that a candidate can loan themselves. There was a Supreme Court case involving Ted Cruz, which uh, the court opined on that issue that a $250,000 cap on the amount that an individual could recover after loaning to their campaign was unconstitutional. We currently have a cap in our code. It's set at $20,000. So as a result of that opinion, we've recommended striking that issue. There are some additional recommendations, as I've alluded to. The other two changes that go into Title 12 in the first item focus on issues that involve the clerk. The clerk is required under our code to uh, review whether or not lobbyists file weekly reports, and if they do not, to fine them for failing to do so. That issue got brought up to the BFCPP, and it became clear that the staffing of the clerk uh, made it in incapable or impractical to go through the process of auditing all of those reports on a weekly basis. And so the recommendation here is just to eliminate the requirement that the city clerk uh, issue those fines. The second issue is that the BFCPP, when they receive a complaint for violations, those initially go to the clerk, and the clerk will review to make sure that they have the sufficient facts in the complaint. If they don't, they're dismissed without prejudice, and the clerk informs the individual of what's missing. That process was just never included in our code, so the change here is to make sure that it's codified. Um, and then the third item, which 
features on the resolution? Is this a change up and a clean up of the resolution where we noticed that there were issues or it could be simplified? One of the things that popped up was that the BFCPP's resolution included language that said they were responsible for all Title 12 complaints. However, some of Title 12 issues deal with things that are outside the authority of the BFCPP. For example, nepotism, election fraud, misuse of public funds. Some of those issues are dealt with by the city, whereas other ones are uh, penal sanctions under the elections code at the state level. So that's the crux of the things that are presented. Um, are there any questions on it? Thank you. Appreciate the presentation. Uh, we will come back for questions. Unless Nora has anything to add at this time, we'll go to public comment. Oh, go ahead, Nora. Um, thank you, Mayor. Sure. Joe, I think you may have had some comments that you wanted to make on your audit. Uh, I think Matthew covered the, the broad outlines, but, I, but I'd be happy to answer any questions for later from council members more specific about the, the audit itself and uh, the issue that were, arose and why we made recommendations. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Okay, uh, Tony, do we have public comment? Yeah, we have um, in-person speakers and Zoom speakers. Um, in person, Poncho Guevara and Kyra um, Kazantis, if you can make your way down to the microphone. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. My name is Poncho Guevara. I'm a resident like of District you're... 6 and Executive Director of Sacred Art Community Service and the Chair of the Board of the Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits. I just wanted to express my support for the staff's memo and the memo from Council Members Jimenez and Cohen. Um, which would expand the current nonprofit exemption to the city's revolving door policy to 501c3 nonprofits. Um, the purpose behind the revolving door policy, as I, if I've come to understand it, is to prevent city employees from utilizing their knowledge and relationships from their time as city workers towards, make, uh, towards personal gain um, uh, or advantage you know, uh, for themselves uh, and taking that, those knowledge and expertise. When it comes to what's happening in the nonprofit sector, largely, is when city staff come to CBOs, is to it's an extension of, of uh, taking their knowledge and experience to actually continue their, their public service, um, actually resolving issues and working on different things with the community. And so the expertise and knowledge that they share on our sector on issues like food, um, COVID response, uh, you know, things like engaging in, in racial equity work and work that we're doing and that, that kind of advocacy really makes a positive impact and it's really not about personal gain or, pro or being able to do it in that way. And so, you know, when staff join a nonprofit organization, they're doing so not to get rich, but as an extension of being able to continue to bring this knowledge and skill sets and continue that work collectively. And, and we, um, again, for that reason, really support you know, the, the, the memo that came from, from the council members and, and where the city staff are coming from and hope that you'll use that in your consideration for your deliberations this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Hi, I'm Kira Kazanza, CEO of Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits. Glad to see you all today. Um, SVCN is a, a alliance of over 170 nonprofit organizations in Santa Clara County and the greater Bay Area, and that's kind of who I'm speaking for. We also support the staff memo and also the memo from council members Jimenez and Cohen um, for the reasons outlined in the letter that was longish and signed by 82 nonprofit organizations. So I won't repeat what we already said in that letter. I did wanna make one clarification though, which is that the revolving door ordinance doesn't prohibit only lobbying. And I think there's some misunderstanding about that. I'm not a lawyer anymore, but the way I read the ordinance at this point is that it also prohibits working on any legislation or administrative matter that the person worked on when they were at city hall. Um, so that means it could affect nonprofit organizers, folks engaged in civic engagement, um, promotorists, uh, policy researchers, and policy educators. Um, so I wanted to just make that clear because I feel like there's a little bit of a misunderstanding on the lobbying front. So we're hoping that you support staff's memo. We hope you vote in favor of that change. And um, I wanted to also say, because I have 47 more seconds, yay on the comment cards. It's a beautiful thing. Thanks for doing that. Allison followed by Trammy. Good afternoon. My name is Allison Brunner. Um, I'm the CEO at the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. We urge the council to support staff's memo and the memo from council members Jimenez and Cohen. 
which would expand the current nonprofit exemption to the city's revolving door ordinance to all 501c3 nonprofits. Unlike for-profit employees and lobbyists, nonprofit professionals act in the public interest for everyone in our San Jose community, supporting residents in need like youth, seniors, and those who are unhoused. Individuals who have knowledge of city programs and priorities are an asset to the city, not a threat or a conflict. Restricting one's ability to advocate for community interests impedes our joint missions and strong, long-standing partnership. Nonprofits already face significant challenges in hiring and retaining staff. Removing the exemption would make it harder for nonprofits to recruit individuals motivated by public service and for the city to partner effectively with nonprofits to achieve its own critical goals and objectives. Thank you for your consideration. Trami followed by Mosaic America. Hi, my name is Trami Crone, Executive Artistic Director for Chopsticks Alley Art. As a small nonprofit, BIPOC-led and woman-owned organization, we already face significant challenges in hiring. We currently have contractors who work for the city and for us. So by removing the nonprofit exemption, it would both make it harder for us to recruit people and motivate um, them to continue public goods and, and services, right? So for all these reasons, rather than removing the limited exemption of nonprofits from the revolving door ordinance, uh, we would like city council to extend the exemptions to all nonprofits rather than only nonprofits with formal relationships with the city. Though we, we also have formal relationship with the city, but we're looking out for our smaller brothers and sisters as well. So we support the specific recommendations of the May 19th, 2023 memorandum by council members Jimenez and Cohen, um, which calls for the exemption to be extended to all nonprofits. Thank you very much. Mosaic America followed by Sujatha. Hello, thank you very much. My name is Usha Srinivasan, and I am the president of a San Jose-based nonprofit, um, Mosaic America. And I'm here to talk about the role of nonprofits as trusted partners to the city. Nonprofits are critically important to the city for achieving its community-related goals. During the pandemic, um, several nonprofits, including ours, um, worked very closely with the city staff, uh, providing a wide range of frontline services. Many of us worked voluntarily for a year on the recovery task force to envision with city staff an equitable recovery from consequences of the pandemic. Most recently, the city developed a nonprofit civic engagement bench, trusting nonprofits to br help bridge gaps between community and the city to support the city's commitment to building greater equity and deep civic engagement. Many of the city's key programs, like the Office of Racial Equity, exist in large part because of nonprofit advocacy. This productive relationship between the city and nonprofits and joint service to the community is a positive. For these reasons, we support staff's recommendation. We thank you for your consideration. Sujatha, followed by Sean. Sujatha, you're unmuted, but we don't hear you. Okay, we're gonna um, move on, put your hand back up when you get your microphone sorted out. Sean, followed by Gregory. Hi, my name is Sean Gerth. I'm the executive director of the nonprofit Educare California Silicon Valley in D7. Today, I'm here to speak in support of staff's memo and the memo from council members Jimenez and Cohen, which would expand the current nonprofit exemption to the city's revolving door ordinance to all 501c3 nonprofits. Nonprofits have really demonstrated that we are trusted partners with the city, especially in achieving its community related goals. We've seen this during the pandemic when nonprofits and city staff work together, providing food, childcare, formula for babies, testing and vaccines, and much, much more to protect our most vulnerable communities. Um, for these reasons, we support the staff's recommendation and we thank you for your consideration. And again, we support staff's memo and the memo from council members Jimenez and Cohen. Thank you so much. Gregory followed by Socorro. 
Hi, this is Greg Kupferly, CEO of Catholic Charities of Santa Clara County. And we also support uh, the memo by Jimenez and Cohen and the staff recommendation um, extending the exemption to all 501c3s. Think of this as we are all public benefit corporations, so our obligation is to the common good, like the obligation of the city staff uh, is to the common good. And so there's not an issue of conflict of interest or private gain uh, to be made by a former city uh, staff member uh, working for a nonprofit on a similar issue uh, that should come before the city. In fact, it's an advantage to the city and to the community as a whole to have much tighter partnership uh, between the city and the nonprofit community. The partnership is terrific, and we want to continue that and uh, want to strengthen our resilience as a community. Thank you. Socorro, followed by Blair. Hello, good afternoon. I'm glad to be joined by so many powerful and amazing humans today. My name is Socorro Montano. I'm a co-director with Latinos United for a New America. I live in District 9 and I work in District 7. Today, I'm also speaking in support of staff's memo and the memo from council members Jimenez and Cohen, which would expand, again, expand the current nonprofit exemption to the city's revolving door ordinance to all 501c3 nonprofits. The purpose behind the revolving door ordinance is to prevent city employees who have separated from the city from using their knowledge or relationships from their time as city workers towards making a profit or to get an unfair advantage with the city. This rationale doesn't apply when a former city staff transitions to a nonprofit as they are not motivated by increasing profits. By definition, nonprofits are guided by their missions for the public benefit rather than a profit. In fact, to even receive 501c3 designation from the IRS, nonprofits legally must serve a public benefit. So any knowledge or relationships would actually be a benefit to the city. The city should be removing, not creating barriers for people who want to benefit the city's residences. For this reason, Luna also supports city staff's recommendations to expand the revolving door exemption to the city's 501c3 partners. We thank you for your consideration. Blair followed by Quinn. Hi, Blair Beekman here uh, at County Board of Supervisors today. They've had an item on uh, Alzheimer's. It's going to be an issue that's growing in the next uh, decade. It's going to double in the next 15 years. Uh, I'm not the most savvy uh, uh, on this item, but I thought I needed to weigh in just to put my voice into this process. Good luck how you can be working on this issue. Um, I think it's... Um, you know, we had a system before that we trusted and respected the nonprofits, and somehow, uh, you know, it feels like something from the corporate community was getting a bit upset about that and feeling they weren't getting their fair share. Um, that kind of hurts because I, I think we have to really respect that a nonprofit, that the nonprofit agencies have a, a certain. Uh, I don't know, uh, understanding of issues that, that uh, the corporate uh, sector does not. And, and, and to respect that sort of relationship and, and what motives are about uh, is important, I think. And um, you're trying to develop uh, new ideas and concepts to that. Uh, please consider that nonprofits are not meant to be profit motivated. And we have to respect that in, in, in our decision making. It creates a different form of decision making than, than profit driven uh, decision making. Thank you. Quinn followed by Paul. Hi, my name is Quinn Thong. I am the executive director of ICANN, a nonprofit organization serving the Vietnamese American community in San Jose and Santa Clara County. Our family resource center is located inside the Vietnamese American Cultural Center within the District 7 of uh, Council Member Duan. I am here to support uh, the staff memo and the memo from Council Members Hymenis and Cohen, which would expand the current nonprofit exemption to the city's revolving door ordinance to all 501c3 nonprofits. Since my colleagues have been, you know, elo have eloquently stated all the reasons, I would like to give you some examples. We nonprofits have are often encouraged to do more for less. 
well, we can't do more for less forever. We can't pull things out of thin airs. We need talent and commitment and resources. And you know, the people who are likely to come to us are either fresh off from school when they are so free and still, you know, uh, want to fly around the world, or when they are after years of service and working, they are financially more established. So please allow them, the, especially the, the latter ones, to come and support us. Things like IT, we really need that. And, you know, also give them a chance to participate in things like uh, Alzheimer's studies that they have been wanting to do all their life, even though they were groomed as an engineer. So please, please uh, support the, the memo, the staff memo and uh, Council of Highness and Cohen's demo. Thank you. Paul followed by Mia. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, there's a lot of corruption in the nonprofits. I think we have a basic assumption that everybody that works for a nonprofit is just has the moral and ethical authority, and that's just not true. The higher you go in the nonprofit industry, and it is an industry, there is more profiteering from the poverty that goes on in the streets. All you have to do, very simply, is look at Somos Mayfair is a, is a prime example of this. Somos Mayfair is probably one of the only nonprofits that got actually richer. They got richer. They have a $9 million budget now. Now, how did they get richer during the COVID epidemic, but everybody else got poor? Because they've been leveraging and they've been based, they're basically an employee of the city. And they're used and leveraged by the city. And here's how it works is what they do is the city is able to say, we work with the community because they gave Somos Mayfair a million dollars to go do the bidding data gathering so that they, so this, the city could know what's going on in the barrios and then craft policy around that. But they didn't, they didn't work with the community. They worked with Somos Mayfair. So they're paying them. This is a pay to play. So there's a tremendous amount of corruption. Just, I just, that's just one example. The other examples are that these people go to different commissions, different committees. Look at Alex Shore. He's another example. Alex Shore will work for a nonprofit, then go and work for a housing committee, and now he wants to be a, a, a council member. Do you see how, and what they do is they leverage the relationships that they built over time in order to extract power? Mia, followed by Chris. Hello, my name is Mia Zill, and I am with the African American Community Service Agency, and I wanted to speak today in support of the memo from Jimenez and Cohen. Um, I just want to say that nonprofits, we bring exceptional service to the community, and we are about the public good and interest, and especially making sure that marginalized groups within the city of San Jose are seen and heard and providing services to them. We are guided by our mission to public benefit rather than for profit. And I believe that nonprofits and all nonprofits that are in the area should be exempt from the revolving door policy. Thank you. Chris. Chris Loxon. You're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Okay, I'm gonna go back to council. Okay, thank you, Tony. Before we jump in, I do just wanna acknowledge we, we have some students from Hillbrook School, which just opened in our downtown, who are touring through. So welcome to City Hall, great to see you all. Welcome to downtown, thrilled to have you here. And I know part of your mission is to explore the city as a classroom and learn from all the things going on here in the city civically. So welcome, we're thrilled to have you as our newest school in downtown. We're gonna jump into the discussion on item 3.3, which is revisions to the revolving door policy. And Nora, just before we jump in, uh, can you just clarify what the staff recommendation is? We have a memo and a staff recommendation. 
Yes, thank you, Mayor. And, and um, the ordinance that we attach, the proposed ordinance, um, we probably should have attached a second one also because really there are two issues for the council to decide. Um, the existing language that allows an exemption from the revolving door ordinance, if you go to work for a nonprofit that receives city funding, is almost counterintuitive, and everyone has struggled with that um, over time. So the auditor in looking at that had made um, recommendations, and so the council really has a choice between um, the uh, recommendations that were made by the auditor, that's why we're bringing this forward, and Joe, do you want to explain your concerns about the existing language and why you were recommend making the recommendations you were making? Sure. So Joe Roy, City Auditor. Uh, in 2017, uh, my office issued an audit related to the city's open government policies and procedures. And as Nora noted, we, we had a recommendation around the revolving door ordinance. So at the time we noted the exemption for the revolving door ordinance was applicable for city officials or designated employees that went on to work for nonprofits who have received city funding in the last five years, while revolving door waivers were required if they wanted to work for a nonprofit that had not received funding. And so we had a recommendation with two policy options. One, uh, basically to simplify the rules, uh, but continue to mitigate potential conflicts of interest, uh, aligning the definition of nonprofits with that found in the lobbying ordinance, which is the 501c3 language, it, uh, or striking the nonprofit exemption such that the same rules apply to former designated employees who worked for nonprofit or for-profit organizations. So it was, it was kind of a policy menu, uh, uh, just trying to simplify the rules. It was referred to the Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices back in 2017, 2018, and then it came back. A couple things of note that are just really important to just know from a context standpoint. One, as I said, Mendez, it, it aligns the definitions between the two, two parts of the, the ordinance, the lobbying and the, and the revolving door ordinance. It also only applies to city employees designated in the city's conflict of interest code who, because of their position and ability to, to influence public decisions, are required to disclose receipts of gifts or potential conflicts of interest annually. These are the Form 700s, what have you. At the time of the audit, there were about 1,000 employees designated in the Conflict of Interest Code. So it, it's not the full range of all city employees. It's only those designated in the Conflict of Interest Code. Um, uh, a speaker noted that it applies not just uh, the, the language that we've been talking about is the lobbying, but it does apply for when an individual uh, works on administrative matters that directly relate to the work they did for the city in the past year. Uh, the other piece of it is in, in neither case uh, of the policy options, does it bar an employee or a, someone from working with a nonprofit after leaving city employment? If they're in those situations, they would be required to re uh, um, uh, request a revolving door waiver. So that's a so it's not a complete. Uh, you know, you can't go do that. You just have to come back and get a waiver. So those are three really important points that it's only relates to those in the conflict of interest code. Those at that time, a thousand. I don't know how many employees there are now, but it's about a thousand employees. Um, it's only for when they're working in uh, lobbying or administrative matters directly related to their former work with the city. Uh, and it doesn't completely bar them from working. So those are three important points. Um, hopefully that provides uh, a bit more context for the discussion. Thank you, Joe. And one of the things, and you may all understand this, but this language that currently exists um, would, for example, allow a council member to push through funding for a uh, particular nonprofit and then be able to, leaving office six months later, be able to go into that nonprofit. And because it had received um, uh, money from the city, would automatically have a waiver. And so that's a simple, um, uh, I think, example of the confusion around the existing language. So it, it needs to be fixed and um, the council can uh, choose to open it up for nonprofits, 501c3s, or um, eliminate the nonprofit exemption, as um, Joe had, had recommended either way. Correct. Okay, so either way, the recommendation from the audit is to, is to be consistent with c3s either way. Correct. Fully exempt or include with everybody else in, the, in the policy. 
Okay, and then Joe, you hit your, your three highlights. And then finally, just before we go into conversation, Matthew, you mentioned in passing that when it went to the BFCPP that their recommendation was to treat all entities the same, it sounded like, but I didn't hear any other context. Can you just tell us what their recommendation was and if there's any more detail there? The recommendation was to eliminate it and treat for-profits and non-profits the same. Uh, in terms of the reasoning for that, I think it was just consistency. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, let's jump into council discussion, and I believe we had Councilor Jimenez first. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for all the work. Um, the <laughs> gone you know in circles with this issue back in May I think when we originally were going to hear it and I know it can get a little confusing there's even been mentioned during the course of this meeting about the memo that was prepared I think back in May or whatever that meeting was that I'm not even sure is attached to to our document or, or our uh, agenda up here but uh, anyhow I, I just wanted to express that uh, what resonated for me is all the comments from all the nonprofits I think Boncho said it well, and, and a lot of the work that they do is really an extension of the, of the city and a lot of the sort of tentacles of the city and trying to better the community, and so that resonated with me as you were going through that, Boncho, along with all the other nonprofit leaders that were making comments. Um, and, uh, and so the other aspect of this, I think, that is important to note is that uh, the changing of the, the revolving door policy from two years to one year, I think there was, uh, at least in the Brown Act, I remember having these conversations with folks, is uh, to bring that in alignment with the state uh, regulations, uh, we thought was a cleaner approach as well. Um, and so with that, uh, I'm not gonna make many more comments, but I'm gonna attempt to make a motion <laughs> to bring together some of the things that were mentioned in the slides, as well as uh, what was in our memo that again, isn't mentioned here, and so, uh, the motion will be to to um, to exempt all 501c3s from from the revolving door policy. We think that's a very clean approach. I think that's a clean approach to, to this. Changing the revolving door policy for everyone else outside of that from two years to one year. Um, in addition, uh, on the staff memo dated August 17th, there's A, B, and C on page one, I believe, and I think some of this encompasses part of this motion. Uh, so, for example, um, A is related to um, the clerk uh, ability to dismiss without prejudice some of the insufficient uh, complaints from the from the board or from folks that are filing complaints. Uh, the other one is related to I think it's adopt the resolution amending regulations procedures for San Jose Board of Fair campaign political practices concerning investigations. And then I think on the um, presentation there was additional considerations or recommendations uh, so that will be brought into the motion as well and so hopefully that encompasses everything that we've touched on let me know d did I leave out anything that you was part of the recommendation no that covers everything but uh, one thing to point out with the change from two years to one year because it's a uh, change in the code of ethics standard that's in our charter that requires a two-third vote yeah the city council yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I think all of us were probably aware of that, but but it, it's certainly something to be considered about uh, or to be thoughtful about given that it, it is a fundamental change in the charter. Um, and uh, so with that, I'll make that motion. Um, and we really, really appreciate a second and look forward to the conversation. Thank you, council member. And just to clarify for those who are looking at the materials, it's essentially the staff recommendation and the memo authored by you and Councilor Cohen, is that correct? Was there another, was there a modification? Yeah, I think that essentially encompasses everything, but I wanted to, I think it was just, I saw different things in different places. I wanted to make sure I brought it all in. So that's why I alluded to, I think, slide, whatever that was, five on the PowerPoint presentation. Yes, item B is a copy of the Title 12 ordinance, which memorializes the recommendations from the memo from Cohen and Jimenez. So a recommendation of the staff changes gets all of the issues. Oh. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Vice Mayor? It's hard to tell when this thing starts. Um, thank you, thank you for that, and, and thank you to all the nonprofits who uh, chimed in. Um, I come from nonprofit. I understand 
um, how important the work of nonprofits are. Uh, I also understand the distinctions between uh, the different uh, types of nonprofits, whether it's a C3, C4, C6, what have you. And I, 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 continue, I continue to um, think about what is, what, is, what is it that we want to, like what is the problem? What do we want to fix? And one of the things that, that I have heard is that uh, there's an unfair advantage uh, from one group or another group or how, however it is that they, they do in terms of lobbying. And one of the things that I, you know, I understand is that um, there is, under the tax code, some um, advantages of being a nonprofit. You don't pay taxes. And in terms of the lobbying part, because I think that when you think about the revolving door policy, um, you know, part of it is who, you, who do you know and who you can lobby, right? And um, according to the, the IRS, um, there is a provision for uh, that they talk about um, whether or not a 501c3 uh, can engage in some lobbying. And apparently they can. So let's just lay that out. They can. But too much lobbying, they cannot do, right? So who is keeping tabs? Who is going to make sure that, you know, we're following what has been laid out? And I think that for those who say, oh, well, you know, political advocacy is too much, uh, and I, I think that's one of the problems, at least from those who uh, feel that there is an unfair advantage, that's what I've heard. So I think that if we're moving down this road of allowing um, nonprofits, uh, you know, sort of a, 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 having a different standard for nonprofits versus for profits, or whether it's a 501c3, c4, c6, uh, my understanding is that Councilmember Jimenez's motion is for c3 only. Correct? Right. So, you know, I think that um, we need to, and I'd like to know, how are we going to ensure that by having it according to what's the motions on the floor, um, that we retain what is supposed to be? And um, just looking at, you know, how, how you tell, how do you tell how much is too much? is really looking at dollar amounts of how much is spent on it, a certain percentage of your revenue spent on lobbying. So how, how are we going to determine that so we know that that's being followed? Council member, that is um, not something that the city has um, been looking at it, under our lobbying ordinance, um, nonprofits are exempt. Um, and so we have not watched that. I think that's more of an IRS issue than a um, city issue. Uh, the uh, question of whether or not a nonprofit is simply um, uh, using all of its money to to lobby or large portions of its money to lobby. I think those issues are raised um, with the federal government. We can uh, look further um, if you want and, and uh, look at the lobbying ordinance. But right now, under our lobbying ordinance, uh, nonprofits are exempt and we don't make a a determination as to whether or not a nonprofit is truly acting as a 501c3 under the IRS code. So we are making a determination to say, if you are a 501c3, therefore, these are the things that apply to you. If they do not follow the rules of a 501c3, then there's kind of a little hole in their, um, you know, if they're not following the, the rules of a 501c3, and we say, well, because you are a 501c3, we're going to allow these certain things. And, and I, think, I, I think to me, it's, it's, it's fine that we're gonna be consistent with the state in terms of a one year, but having overseen a 501c3 and 501c4, 
I understand why people want to have a 501c4, right? And, you know, I mean, you know, it's up to the organization. I know organizations that have a sister organization because they want to do the lobbying, because they're doing greater advocacy, because they're doing more uh, campaign and political work. So I just feel that if we're going to use that as the, the standard, then we ought to know what does that standard mean. So I, I just think that, that and I, I know a lot of nonprofits, and I know that there are very good, well-run nonprofits, but I also know that there are those who are not, just like anything, right? So I just put that out there as, if we're using this criteria, I think it's great. I have no problem with it. I think it's, it's, it's wonderful to um, have that kind of knowledge in nonprofits, but I also think that we should know what we're doing. So, that's it. Thanks, Vice Mayor. Councilmember Batra. <clears throat> One point of clarification, which was made the comment about the council member being able to give the money, and is council member defined as an employee in this case who is subject to this one year, or the council member is, uh, it's the staff of the council member? The, the uh, revolving door ordinance does apply to council members um, and executives within the city, as, as well as employees of a certain level that have to file Form 700s and, and have other yeah. uh, rules apply to them. Okay. All right. Okay. So I see that there are 1.5 million nonprofits in the United States, and there are $2.5 trillion of money flows to the nonprofits. So, the concern about the nonprofits having undue influence because they're receiving so much of money, okay, the contractors receive the money. So the cities give the money to the nonprofits. So the idea about having whether they should be able to lobby or they should not be able to lobby is really based on the idea that the money is being given to them. And in some cases, some of the nonprofits receive from the city much more money than for-profit companies may be receiving. So the idea, the way we had our uh, re uh, revolving door policy that if you received money in the last five years, you were exempt. The ones who were not received the money, they were not able to uh, hire any of the people. I think that was very validly pointed out. It should not ever have been the case because the rationale is really upside down, <laughs> if anything. So it's very good that we are trying to streamline that, that it's uh, one rule whether you have received money or you're not. Secondly, going from two years to one year, I think it aligns with the state regulations. So hence it gives a little bit of a check and balance rather than striking it all together that there's no revolving door limitation applies. So giving the nonprofits which have recently received somewhat of a bad reputation, some justifiably, but others. So the concern about the nonprofit having too much influence or having easy access to the city officials with their people who have, uh, I think the current proposed regulation of Extending it to all 501c, I agree with that one because the other one was totally wrong. The second one, not having any time limitation is not appropriate. So I support the two year to one year uh, reduction, but having it equally applied everywhere. So there's at least some checks and balances and the reputation of the nonprofit should be more protected in that way. So I'll be supporting the motion uh, and with the two-year reduction to one year, 
and extending it to all the 501c3 uh, corporations as defined in the new way. Okay. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Foley. Thank you. First, I, I just want to acknowledge that there is absolutely no question that the work of the nonprofits is extremely important to the success and benefit of the residents of our city. There's just absolutely no question to that. You could start listing some of the things that if we took away all the nonprofits, all of the benefits to our residents from arts to housing to food to seniors to, to health, well-being, uh, advocacy, uh, our city would not be as rich as it is today by the involvement of the nonprofits. I'm going to support the motion on the floor, and the reason is because I find it actually amazing that we would allow an exemption to exist for nonprofits who benefit financially from the city to the revolving to an exemption of the revolving door, but we don't allow it for nonprofits who don't benefit financially, it seems to me we should level the playing field. And that means that we should, in, be, this is the motion on the floor, that we should exempt all nonprofits from the revolving door, uh, door policy. Additionally, uh, the reduction to one year makes a lot of sense to me, but uh, Nora, I have a couple questions for you. You mentioned that this motion requires eight is it, or two thirds, is it just the one year term that requires two thirds or is it the whole ordinance change that requires two thirds? It's the, I'm sorry, council member. It's the, um, a two thirds vote is required under the charter when there is a um, change in uh, an ethical standard and going from two years to one year, um, so, uh, shortening the time that someone would be um, not allowed to uh, work for someone that was uh, having them do the same work that they did for the city so in lobbying the city um, representing this representing another organization for the city so because it's going to one year that's a loosening of the ethical standard okay so, so that that, that component you consider requires uh, the two-thirds vote yes. the other piece uh, removing the exemption or imply, uh, enforcing, allowing the exemption for all nonprofits does not require the eight. Is that what you're saying? It's it's not for all nonprofits. It's for 501c3s. 501 501c3s. Sorry, Bef I, I meant yeah. to clarify that. Yeah, 501c3s. Bef before we were talking about okay. all nonprofits. So in that sense, we're narrowing uh, the uh, exemption to 501c3s. Okay, um, Th that's the. Thank you, that's really helpful. Uh, the reason I, I support uh, moving from two years to one years is that these are individuals who work at City Hall who are doing good work at City Hall. Then they leave City Hall. They want to go work for a nonprofit. Good for them. They're going to a nonprofit and probably, uh, frankly, I know we have some nonprofits in the room, not making as much if they could go to the for profit world. They're going to a nonprofit for the labor of love, for the passion, for the reason and the purpose of this nonprofit. So to say to these people who want to contribute to the community through a nonprofit that they can't do that for two years, that just seems unfair in their career path. So I would encourage council to vote yes to support this motion that's on the, ta on the floor right now which includes the one year uh, time frame and exempts all 501c3 nonprofits. Thank you. Thanks, Councilmember. Councilmember Cohen? I keep forgetting that when you push the button, it turns on my light and then I push it and turn it off. So. <laughs> anyway, um, well, first I want to thank staff for the work that you've done since May when you brought this forward because we, we there was a lot of debate at the time and not we weren't sure exactly where this was going to go and so I want to thank you for going back and being thoughtful and deliberate about it, listening, reading the memos, and make, giving a, a direction that I think makes sense for the for the city. So thank you for that. Thank you for coming back. Thanks to all the nonprofit leaders who are here and and talking to us about the importance of the work they do, reminding us of the importance of the work that they do, in partnership with the city. Um, you know, I, every year we're 
we are providing resources to nonprofits because nonprofits are an extension of the work that we do for the residents here in the city. And so, you know, it's, it's interesting that sometimes we hear people say, well, the nonprofits have an advantage, the nonprofits are, are profiting, are benefiting off of this. Well, the residents of the city are benefiting off of the, re the investment that we're making in the work that they do. And we don't hear during the budget process people saying, hey, these nonprofits shouldn't get the money to do the work that we need them to do. So, I, you know, I think it's important that we recognize that. And, and my understanding, actually, even though there is some, it's, it's non-intuitive that we have this current distinction between how nonprofits receive money and nonprofits that don't are treated, I think my, I, I've come to understand that, that there is in, intended to be this free flow of people that are serving the same constituents as city and nonprofit employees that actually enhances the work that both do, the city and the nonprofits. And that was the reason for that exemption, although I think it makes more sense to exempt all 501c3s and be consistent. I, I just want to make it clear that there, there was some logic originally in the way this was set up even though it might not be obvious what that logic was. Um, so anyway, I, we, we, you know, we do have a process for waivers. We receive so few of them. Does anyone know how many waivers we've actually had to approve in the last you know, few years? It's probably in the single digits of how many in five years that we've even had. So you know, I, th I think we're also, um, you know, we're not talking about a huge flow of people between the two organizations, and I think we ought to allow uh, this to be a simpler, more streamlined approach for those who want to do that good work and continue the good work. So I'm thankful, thanks to um, the, my colleagues who are in my discussion Brown Act group that we had and Councilmember Jimenez for joining me on the memo that we wrote. Thank you for staff for adopting that recommendation and I look forward to um, the vote. Thank you. Councilor, I just want to be clear. Staff didn't adopt the recommendation. That was a that was a kind of a clerical error, I think. But I think we clarified that. That's we have correct. two options, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, we're on to Councilor Ortiz. All right, there we go. Um, no, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I want to thank my colleagues for putting together this memo. I 100% agree. Um, with the recommendations as well as this, the recommendations from city staff. I formally, I come out of the nonprofit industry um, before I was uh, elected to city council and I received a very humble salary for that work, actually half of what I'm making uh, at, at this point. Um, and many people go into the nonprofit industry to give back to our community for the, and, and many times that's the same reason why people get into local government. and into um, public service. Um, so I, I personally believe that we should not be putting barriers up for people who want to serve in a different capacity uh, from working at the city. We should be, in fact, streamlining the, those opportunities. And I, you know, I, I agree with the quote unquote upper hand that nonprofits get both um, and when it comes to taxes uh, and, other, and other forms, whether it's making them uh, more eligible for grants or other orders, other sort of um, uh, benefits, right? Th these are organizations that do not run for the purpose of generating income for shareholders um, or for investors, right? There may be individuals who are making six figures that are at the executive level, um, but I think in many ways you need to have some sort of competitive wages um, to take to provide incentives for people to work. In that in that industry, so uh, I'm going to be supporting the memo, um, and and uh, and I want to thank all the nonprofit organizations because my district had three out of the top five uh, zip codes that were impacted by COVID-19, and many of our families would not have survived the pandemic if it wasn't for organizations like Somos Mayfair, Luna, Latinos United for a New Organize, uh, New America, and other organizations who were going door to door offering PPE um, and other things. So, I mean, I understand that some people have negative perceptions, but these organizations have saved lives in East San Jose. Thank you. Thanks, Council Member. Council Member Candelas. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, I, I too want to thank staff for, for their, their work on this and their presentation, um, and want to reiterate a few comments already said from a few of my colleagues. Uh, especially per pertinent to the value. Um, I, I think that there is value that having former city staff at 
our nonprofits uh, doing the work, having the uh, institutional knowledge and, and, and the, the intricacies of, of what, what goes on at the city hall is mutually beneficial. Uh, we, we work hand in gloves with a lot of these, or, hand in glove with a lot of these organizations. And um, you know, we often rely on them to do our in-depth community outreach. And so having, having this uh, exemption makes sense. I, I, I just want to thank my colleagues, uh, Jimenez and, and Cohen, for their leadership on this issue. And I, I look forward to supporting the motion on the floor. OK. Um, we've not heard yet from Councilor Dwan. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Staff, I, I think it's about time that we make it equitable for all of the nonprofit organization. The exemption is also good. I think it'd be a beneficial for both the nonprofit organization, but also uh, for city employee who decide to join the nonprofit. Um, I just want to say thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Councilor Davis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I too, like Councilmember Ortiz, came from the, the nonprofit world. I worked in a uh, nonprofit just out of college and, and then worked for an educational institution. So I'm also a product of nonprofits as well and very greatly respect the work that they do. Um, there is no doubt that, that most nonprofits, I'm not going to say all nonprofits because there are bad apples everywhere, but most nonprofits do great work. And of course, we fund the nonprofits. Um, locally to extend the work that the city does. It is also true, however, that 501c3s do come and advocate for city policies, and so they are lobbying, and sometimes they're doing that, um, maybe not with city money, but sometimes the nonprofits that are partially funded by the city come and, and advocate for city policies, just like other nonprofits do and, and for-profit for companies do. Um, so I've really struggled with this one because I just have, a, have trouble with the lack of transparency about the flow of city employees to 501c3s that do come here on a regular basis and ask us to support or oppose certain policies. Um, it would make more sense for me to eliminate the exemption as the, the board recommended and I think, I think that's fair and I think that's consistent and I'm, I just think it's a transparency issue. They, it doesn't mean that people can't go to work for those 501c3s. They could come here for a waiver in the time that I've been on council. There, so this is over six years now. I think there have been maybe four. I can remember three off the top of my head. There might be one I'm missing that have come in, in to ask for a waiver, whether they were for a nonprofit, Kira came in <laughs> for a waiver and got one, um, or, or a for-profit, although um, I, may, I may regret that. <laughs> I may have come to regret that vote uh, because they have come to lobby us. <laughs> um, but, but they have all passed without really, frankly, much discussion, and I think they were all unanimous votes. So it's just a transparency issue to come and ask the council and just to make it public where you're going when you've come from the city and that you'll be working on public issues or working on local issues so that the public knows. So I'm really uncomfortable with, um, with extending the exemption. I think the, the delineation, if, if it sounds like this is gonna pass um, to all 501c3s, I, I just, I find that it's a little bit difficult for me to, to swallow, so I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not supportive of that part of the motion. I'm supportive of the rest of it. I think two years to one year in how fast life moves and how much people change in jobs, I think I'm totally supportive of that. I think the half-life is really short on uh, people's influence when they're away from the city, but um, I can't, I just can't support extending the exemption to all 501c3s. And I'd like to ask the maker of the motion if they'd be willing to, to bifurcate the I motion. I would. I would. Okay with the seconder? No. To bifurcate, to split okay. out that specific <laughs> yes. component so we'd vote on them separately. Thank you. 
Okay, we, we still have a hand up. Our, is council member, is that all? Yeah, I appreciate Councilor Davis's points and was going to make some similar comments myself. Wanted to hear from colleagues first. You know, one thing we all agree on in the specific question of exempting C3s is that the old policy uh, seemed kind of arbitrary and, and counterintuitive, nor, nor gave the example of, and I think this is why Joe brought forward his audit recommendations, nor gave the example of, uh, you know, someone at the city, perhaps a council member or staff member, working hard to get money into the budget to go to a nonprofit and then explicitly being exempt from the revolving door policy to go work for, for that nonprofit that received funding from the city, uh, but having the revolving door policy applied for nonprofits that have not received funding from the city. So that's clearly counterintuitive. But to me, the answer to that is not then to extend the exemption to all nonprofits, but actually the opposite, which is what the board of fair campaigns and political practices recommended, which is to treat C3s like every other hiring entity out there and to be consistent across the board. And I think Councilor Davis laid that out pretty well. First of all, we're talking about a policy, a revolving door policy that builds trust with the community that applies to one, maybe one in seven city employees that only applies to going to work in functions that involve lobbying and advocacy, not other jobs within the nonprofit. And you can come get an exemption. You can come get a waiver yourself, which rarely happens, but when it's happened, we've always approved. So I, I'm not quite sure what we're solving for here. Let me ask a couple of questions. Um, first, Nora, a question for you. Um, in, your, in your opinion, you know, do C3s lobby the city? Yes, C3s lobby the city. Maybe not every C3, um, and as I indicated under our lobbying ordinance, um, they do not have to register. The, uh, the people working for the um, C3s don't have to register as lobbyists with the city also. Okay. Um, and then, Jennifer, roughly you know, ballpark, order of magnitude, how much funding do, does the city transfer to 501C3s on an annual basis? Just roughly. Yeah, I don't really have a number, uh, and I don't do, do I won't do it on the top of my head. But it is millions of dollars. M uh, many of our departments rely heavily on our nonprofit partners to deliver our work to our community. So okay. it's it's spread in many many departments, but it is millions. So we have a very close relationship, as folks have said. Many of our nonprofits are extensions of the work we do as a city. So we make big decisions involving contracts that include millions of dollars, where we're choosing between nonprofits. Um, so, Joe, when you did your audit, uh, you know, was part of your assessment about the kind of relationships and influence that a former city employee might have in going to work for any entity, including a nonprofit? So, at the time of the audit, you know, the, the, substance, of the um, substance of what we were looking at and the, the discussions we were having with city staff really just raised how much confusion there was around it and how unclear it was. In terms of the, the scope of lobbying, uh, again, as, as Nora said, they, uh, lobby, 501c3 uh, organizations did not need to register, so we, we couldn't really tap into those, those records um, uh, or, or look at, you know, we did look at, we had some other recommendations around the lobbying ordinance, but, but it wasn't re related to uh, nonprofits. It was, it, was, it was some other recommendations that have been implemented by Tony. Uh, so, much of what we were focused on was this confusion that we, you know, in talking with the attorneys, talking with the uh, city clerk, talking with city staff, it just wasn't really clear what was going on. And then, of course, the just the, the, the common sense piece of it of, of seeing the, the different treatment, you know, was, like I said, we had the, the two policy option. One was to narrow it to the 501c3 and spread it across all or, or eliminate it completely. So it truly was a policy option that we put out there. Yeah, appreciate that. So look, I've worked in the nonprofit sector, started nonprofits, have spent a lot of years supporting nonprofits. My first company was all about helping nonprofits raise money and, and do organizing. But it, it, you know, it seems pretty clear to me that nonprofits are in fact an extension of our work and work extremely closely with our departments and compete for and secure millions of dollars worth of contracts every year that to me feels like the very place 
where we'd want to not have exemptions around our ethical rules, around the level of transparency, register, whether or not you're registering as a lobby, lobbyist, being clear about who you're meeting with, being clear about when senior staff goes to work in-house at an organization, because those very contracts from different city departments are often given out competitively between nonprofits. Why would we want to incentivize a nonprofit to um, hire a senior staff member who might give them an upper hand based on the relationships they have within a given department. I mean, it feels to me of all the work we do, this is where one of the areas where there's the greatest room for conflict of interest. Not to say that the missions and work of those nonprofits aren't incredibly important and public serving. They're good organizations that do good work that benefit people every day, but it's exactly the kind of place where there is an interest in having relationships with the city that is approving millions of dollars worth of contracts. So it, it, to me, it, the, the correct interpretation of the confusion that Joe just described would be to say, this one little exemption doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Let's just have a blanket policy across all employers, all entities that might come to the city for a contract, all entities that might come and benefit from having close relationships with senior staff at the city. So it, to me, the logic I'm hearing here feels a little backwards. The policy option, and we were given two, of just removing the exemption and treating all entities the same, holding ourselves to that high ethical standard of great transparency and clarity and if, again, if a senior staff member is going to work, at least coming to us and putting on the public record, I'd like a waiver and here's why, I just think is the right thing to do. And I, I don't quite understand why we would be rationalizing extending the exemption to more organizations. So I'm, I'm a little confused about the logic on the, of where we're going with the motion on the floor right now. Uh, go ahead, Joe. One other piece of confusion that, that came up at the time of the audit was this question of who does it apply to, and that's why I, when I spoke earlier, uh, noting that it, it truly only uh, relates to those individuals designated in the conflict of interest code. So talking with staff, um, they don't know whether they are subject to the revolving door. I, I mean, in, you know, am I subject, I'm going to go work for this nonprofit, well, are you a Form 700 filing? Well, maybe not. Then then you wouldn't be subject to it. So that was another piece of confusion that just needs to be kind of cleared up because it's not every employee that, that it would be affected. It, it is truly just those, those individuals in the conflict of interest code yeah. who are in decision-making positions. Correct. And that seems like another thing we could do a better job of communicating internally with our, with our workforce. Jennifer, I'm just going to come back to you quickly. So roughly yeah, so the I, dollar I had, amount I asked, of asked, C3 contracts on an annual basis. Yeah, so I, I asked staff to look that up. Our latest report was from June 30th, 2019, and we provided close to 47 million, um, and that was in the form of grants, operational and maintenance agreements, and in-kind support. So it was in that ball form. We haven't, we don't have an updated number, but uh, we're working on that. Okay, so about 47 million just in 2019, pre-pandemic, where of course during the pandemic we yeah. saw uh, over 100 million dollars flow in one-time funding. Okay. Um, so I, you know, I'd certainly support a substitute or otherwise all on the bifurcated motion, likely vote the way that it sounds like my colleague Councilmember Davis is heading here, but I um, just wanted to lay out a few more thoughts and appreciate my colleagues' comments. Uh, I think I'm back to the Vice Mayor. Thank you. Um, I have a clarifying question for Nora, because, um, and, and maybe I just didn't hear it correctly, because we're making um, our decision on the establishment of, of a 501c3, and if we are not following what the qualifications were for, to, to have a 501c3, then I think that it's a problem for me because I just think that we need to be consistent that if you qualify for that status, and I understand that the IRS has their rules and everything like that, but we as a city are saying we are taking that status and we're going to make a determination for this, 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 this. Um, I think we need to be clear as to, um, and maybe we just need to have the, the lobbying ordinance come back to us, uh, but I, I really think that, that we can't just throw our hands up and say, oh, well, it says that, but it's a federal code, and we don't, but we're using that as the basis for making decisions. So if we're not clear as to, oh, well, you know, 50% of their work is lobbying, 
And I'm just using that as an example. Then, you know, it's, to, to me, to me, it, it, it doesn't stand on anything. So I, I just feel that, um, you know, the motion on the floor, it's gonna be bifurcated, but I also think um, I'd like to ask the maker of the motion if they would be willing to include a clear definition of what we as a city consider 501c3 because if we're going to say oh that's the that's the federal but we're using it as a basis for making decisions um that 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 to me doesn't sound right there's a question to the uh, yeah. yeah go ahead councilor Jimenez. I'm curious if, if you all, if staff has any thoughts on how, how to create that framework, it seems, that we want to, that the vice mayor is talking about, in which we would sort of better understand or um, create policies in which we know what type of 501c. Well, see, the, I guess the, I'm thi to, the I'm, thing, I'm thing is that here we're saying right. that under 501c3, we're going to allow X, Y, whatever it is that we decide because you have that status. And I think that's fine. But if we, staff, or whoever it is that's implementing this is saying, well, we understand that a, as a 501c3, you can, you, there is a limitation on lobbying. And we're not looking at that because, well, that's, the, that's an IRS rule. That's a problem for me because the reason why we're giving them this exemption is because they're established at the federal level as a 501c3. So we need, we, the implementers, need to be clear as to, you know, those who are, you know, like keeping up with it. If you don't mind me asking, just a clarification, because I, I, my mind is going in a particular place. I want to make sure I'm, I'm understanding. Uh, is what you're suggest? Are, are you sort of touching on like a monitoring component to this, how we're gonna be monitoring whether the 501c3s that are defined by the IRS code that are lobbying the city are in fact 501c3s and behaving in such way? Is that what, is that what well, we're I, getting at? Well, so. I, I guess I'm, I'm not throwing that out there, but I think that to Council Member Davis's point on how do we ensure an open and transparent process, right? I mean, you know, you can go get their 990s and take a look at all their stuff and everything, but, but I, I just think that, that we are making a decision on this status. And it bothers me that um, we kind of like, oh, well, but, you know, that's a federal kind of thing. And I, I don't feel that, that that's sufficient for me to say that, oh, well, 501c3, but that's kind of a tax code thing. It is the basis on which we're making this decision. But can I, can I, I guess I'm trying to understand, are you, are you concerned that some 501c3s that fit the federal, you know, the IRS definition, that they are behaving in X way? And yeah, you, they're not in compliance. They're not in compliance. They're not in compliance with what? With, with, the, with, with what they're supposed to be doing, right? And, you know, like, hey, you know, a lot of people don't get caught, but that's, you know, the way it is sometimes. I just want to be very clear for the city, you know, others, whatever, they do whatever. But, yeah. but I just want to be clear that if we say this is the basis on which we're making this decision, that we know what we're talking about. And I just want it to be clear. You know, the whole thing was because there wasn't clarity. This is an opportunity to have clarity. And if we say you are in good standing as a 501c3, great, you get this, you know, exemption. And I'm okay with that, but I just want to make sure that as we're, you know, sort of doing that, and, I, and we may have to bring our lobbying thing back, our lobbying ordinance back. I'd like to hear what the city attorney has to the, um, Thank you. Uh, good questions, council member, um, or vice mayor Kamei. It, it, the, um, 501c3 status, if you will, and, and you understand this because you've been with a nonprofit. You can be a for profit corporation or a nonprofit corporation. It's a yeah, form yeah. of how you're doing business. The 501c3 is a federal IRS 
descriptor, if you will, and you have to <coughs> comply with federal law and those kinds of things. In answer to your question, as I'm sitting here listening to you, um, it, it may be that for someone to um, be going to a 501c3 and to be saying that they are exempt from the revolving door, um, that number one, they'd have to be a, a level of employee that is affected by the revolving door. And then if they're exempt um, from the revolving door, I suppose there could be an examination of whether or not that 501c3 is in good standing with the um, federal government, with the IRS. I, I don't know where that information resides in, in uh, the federal um, bureaucracy, but I assume one could find out if a 501c3 was in good standing. Um, and I guess you could take it the next step also. They have to be um, in good standing with the state of California in terms of their, uh, with the Secretary of State and in terms of those kinds of um, requirements. We could look at that, um, but it's a little bit hard right now to imagine how we how we might do that. If um, if someone if we know someone's going off to work for a 501c3 nonprofit, um, number one, we the city administration would need to know that, or we'd have to have some type of disclosure provision on the part of the employee. It would probably be easier if the employee who was leaving or official who was leaving um, also provided to the clerk, perhaps, um, a valid, some type of verification that, in fact, they have confirmed that the 501c3 is in good standing with the state and with the federal government. Um, that, that could be required and might address your concern um, that it that it is a, a organization that's in good standing um, and that their nonprofit tax exempt status is, is not being challenged. Um, and we could think more about it, but the, that's just on the spot. That's about the most I can think about because this is, or come up with, this is, this is really um, a revolving door ordinance and um, whether or not the city and, and the council is comfortable with people um, leaving city, it's leaving the city, and for a year or two years going to work for um, an entity that um, is doing business with the city and potentially lobbying the, the council yeah. or so, city staff. So I, so I guess maybe um, another uh, look at the lobbying ordinance is, is in order um, because I think that maybe that is the vehicle to fix it. So I'm okay with that. So, so if, I, if I may, just because sure. she was asking me. <laughs> uh, you know, what, 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 what I suspect as well is that if this, this in fact passes, and correct me if I'm wrong, Nora, that if someone feels that there is an organization that's not a 501c3 but that's operating as if they're exempt, they can, someone can make a complaint to the Board of Fair Campaign. I mean, so there's other avenues in which some of that can be addressed, I think, theoretically. And so, and so what I would say, Vice Mayor, is uh, I'm, I think I'll, I'll leave that, uh, th that um, friendly amendment on the shelf. Uh, I think we need to yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, assess that out a little bit, but, uh, but thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilor Cohen? All right, thank you. Um, just a couple additional comments. Uh, first, I, w I think it's important to clarify what the bifurcation was, <laughs> um, because, and also clarify what that means for people who may not have gone through it before. Um, we split the motion into two motions that we'll vote on separately because we know that some people feel supportive of a portion but not the other portion, so that's what the reason was. Just to be clear about your bifurcation request, because there's not just two items, there's a whole bunch of things that were in the original memo. Are, which, how are you bifurcating the uh, motion? So I was just requesting a bifurcation to, to take out the, the one portion that um, extends the exemption. Okay, the so one, one The 501c3 vote. exemption. So one vote will be on all parts of the original motion, and the other vote will be on 
whether or not to extend the exemption to all 501c3s, and those will be two separate votes. Just want to make sure that's clear. That's correct, and I was going to clarify before we vote, but I appreciate okay. it. Yeah, okay. I was going to um, say I should clarify that with the, the actual maker of the motion. That that was what I was asking. That was my okay. understanding. <laughs> okay, thank you. We've been on council long enough. Sergio can And I just want to ask a mind. couple questions based on what I heard other comments or to make a couple comments based on other comments that were made. The mayor said that this only pertains to people who would be doing lobbying, but I thought I heard you say that this pertains to anyone who might be doing policy or anything within a 501c3 and not just the lobbying. Is that correct? That's correct. So there's both the lobbying ordinance and the revolving door ordinance. The revolving door portion applies to general work on issues that you might have been dealing with while you were at the city as opposed to just lobbying. So anybody who goes and works for the nonprofit and works on something that re relates to city business in any way, whether it's clerical or, or writing policy, would be, would, is covered by the, by the revolving door policy, which, we're, which this motion would exempt 501c3s from having to, to follow. That's correct, okay. assuming they're an employee it applies to. Assuming that they're one of those employees that that's required, that, that's covered by it. Correct. I get that. Um, and then the other, I just wanted to make a comment. I, I guess we've probably already gone past this question about 501c3s, but you know, 501c3s are required to do a lot of paperwork every year to ensure that they remain on good standing in 501c3. There's, there's a, it's actually a lot of work, I think, as a 501c3 to, to keep that status. So you know, I, I think it's not necessarily our place to be the arbiter of that, but to allow that process to be the arbiter of that and so therefore um, you know I think it's fair for us to s assume that an organization that retains its 501c3 status uh, is being is not is not lying about their work and not falsely filing the paperwork they do with the IRS every year so that's all I'll comment on those issues great thanks council member council member Torres yeah uh, mayor is it okay if I ask Kira a question? I was loud. Uh, yeah, you may ask someone to come forward and answer a right. question. Go ahead. Hi, Kira. I have a couple questions for you. Uh, Kira, hi. Hello. How are you? Hope your daughter is doing well in college. Uh, do do nonprofits have to publicly publish 990s that disclose lobbying amounts? Yeah, every year we do a 990. It goes to the feds. It's also required to be published, so we have to put it on our website or some other place. And then a lot of like nonprofit um, aggregator organizations like GuideStar and Candid and groups like that, they, in order to get like a gold star or a platinum star, you have to put it, all that financial information, including lobbying information, up in a public place. Okay, great. And the other question is uh, for-profits don't have to do that, correct? I'm not aware that they do, no. Okay. Uh, Thank you. That's that's but it. Oh, you would know. Oh, <laughs> I forget. Oh, Eric? we're kind of comparing oh. notes there, but yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll just ask you the question. Right. So that's okay. All Thanks. right. Thank you. Uh, that, Thanks. that was it. Yeah. Uh, so I think before most of us dealt with 990s, since we all worked in the nonprofit sector, before we dealt with 460s and 410s, right? Uh, and f f you know, to me, I think it's uh, it's 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 extremely important to make sure that, you know, there, there are some elected officials who, who want to go back into the field that they, they, they were working in, right? So none, some of us don't want to don't wanna go uh, into lobbying or get big contracts, right, as a consultant. And so I think, uh, you know, the, the memo proposed by my fellow colleagues outlines, uh, outlines that, and I hope that my colleagues support it. So thank you. Great, thanks. I will just note, I, I don't know that the activities covered in the 990 is quite what I'm referring to. What I'm talking about is the power of influence based on relationships. And for those who want to go work in the nonprofit sector, who knows, one day maybe that's what I'll be doing when I leave the council. Uh, that's why we have the waiver process. And I, I don't think we've rejected a waiver, but I think that level of, that process and level of transparency has been valuable uh, for the community and, and ensuring public trust and the integrity of our, of our city decision making. Uh, okay, we are on to, back to Councilmember Batra. I want to clarify the bifurcation uh, on the, uh, the, I understand the whole yeah. package, which is a two year, included two year to one year, yeah. but on the other side, extending 
currently the proposal is to extend to all 501c3 corporations totally exempt them the from exemption, the exemption yeah so there actually will be three votes just to clarify so, unless there's a substitute motion and these are the three votes right there will be a vote that would require two-thirds to reduce the revolving door policy from two years to one year right there would be a vote that would require a simple majority that would extend the exemption to all 501c3 nonprofits. That would exempt them from the revolving door policy, period. No time amount right. required. And then there would be a third vote requiring a simple majority for the other language cleanup and other items. Okay? Those would be the, the three. But may, may regarding. Point, of, point of order, that's not what I understood. It. I understood sorry. it just going to be two votes. One yeah. for the we'll, we'll need to have three because one requires two thirds. So Nora's asked that we break out the two thirds vote for that the, item because it's the other two only require a simple majority. The the reduction in time under the charter will require a two thirds vote. Yeah, the, because it, two years of yeah. one year. Yes, Correct. and because that's a loosening of um, the ethics policy as it is right now. So that's two thirds, right. and then um, uh, Council Member simple Davis majority. had asked. The, um, that the 501c3 piece of this be separated out, and then you had everything else. So everything else doesn't require two thirds. Correct. So that's why you're. That's okay. right. The, the language cleanup. Yeah. yeah. So, I understand. So, okay. Okay. So the one, the mayor, which I want the clarification on is the extending to all 501c3s. If that motion is defeated. Are we still with the old definition of then the two? Okay, if we want to get to the staff recommendation, which was to clean up that nobody has an exemption, is that supposed to be a new motion or is that going to come through? You are, you are welcome to make a substitute motion. Okay. You can't, I mean, so, that. So so as long as it is we all just we all just went through the process recently sorry you, you uh, but yes to, to ask your question narrowly answer your question narrowly if that is defeated my understanding is and order to clarify we would be left with the status quo currently if it's defeated there's there's a, there would be there would it would be in, so the way to do it is you vote against the motion on the floor and then, and then if we, it fails you can make, a, can new make a new motion for the other change exactly yeah so so that definition which existed, that was a very bad definition. So we would not want that to exist. At least I don't want it to exist. Right. So, so if that is, if we defeat this one, so the motion needs to be replaced right now or would we get a chance to replace it later? We, we can take a motion after. If it were to fail. We will be able to. We, okay, so we yes. wouldn't be. All right, so then I'm fine with it. Uh, yeah, no, I, don't, I don't think anyone likes the status quo. The, uh, that's why the auditor gave us two options. Not, yes. I don't think any of us think the status quo policy there makes sense. Right. Okay. Yeah. So we wouldn't want to leave with that one today. <laughs> no. Okay. 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 Anything else? And, 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 no, with that clarification that we'll be able to make the motion later and not leave with that other one if we don't want to, okay. then I'm fine. Um, if it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, I don't see any other hands, so let's, t let's vote. We have th three votes. Okay, so the first vote we're gonna do is the changing from two year to one year, which requires a two thirds vote. Correct. So I wanna be clear that everybody knows what we're voting on. Motion passes with um, Mayor Mahan and Councilmember Dwan voting no. Okay, so that passes. So the second vote is ex um, the 501c3 exemption issue. So this would, voting yes, would extend the exemption to all 501c3s, yes. the revolving door exemption to yes. all 501c3s. Now that that's clarified, does anybody want to, I think you, you can still change your vote. And I'm about to end it, just want to make sure. Okay, so that motion passes with Mayor Mahan, Councilmember Davis, Councilmember Dwan, and Councilmember Batra voting no. 
and I'm announcing this out loud because the Zoom callers can't see the screen. And then the third vote. We did not get a chance to vote. Does it show Batra? Yeah, it shows Batra no you voted against. No, right? Okay, so now we're going to vote on everything else. I'm still waiting on one vote, but it doesn't show me who hasn't voted yet. So everyone voted? Check uh, your screen. I think we're waiting on Councilmember Batra. Okay. Okay, and that passes. Motion passes with um, Councilmember Dwan voting no. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you to staff, appreciate it. All right, we are on to item 10.2. This is a land use item, and I believe there is a short staff presentation. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Chris Burden, Director of Planning, Building, Code Enforcement. Joined by John Tu, Division Manager for our Development Review Team in Planning. Um, we'll just run through a quick presentation. Um, the item before you, um, sorry, let me start at the start. The item before you is a plan development zoning, plan development permit and tentative map for a project at 4146 Mitzi Drive. Um, just a little background to start with, this project um, is one that we've been working on for a considerable amount of time. An initial special use permit uh, was approved back in 2020. The original uh, permit application came back in 2018 uh, to construct 40 units uh, in a four-story apartment complex um, and included the relocation of the Graves House uh, on the project site. Um, the applicant did submit an application uh, for the on-site on relocation and rehabilitation of the Graves House um, and then, but then with a change to construct 12 townhomes on the site. Uh, unfortunately, in November of last year, due to fire, um, the historic resource was uh, burnt and um, uh, significantly uh, diminished. Um, <clears throat> so staff has been working since then to revise the entitlements on the site um, with the applicant. So the project components, uh, the plan development zoning would allow uh, for the zoning to be aligned with uh, the underlying general plan designation. So it would go from uh, urban residential to uh, plan development zoning district that's largely consistent. Um, the permit would allow removal of 33 trees and then the construction of 12 townhomes um, in f four three-story buildings. Um, and then would also incorporate the reconstruction of the Graves House with uh, those materials that were salvaged after the fire. It also includes a vesting tentative map to divide the parcel. Um, so obviously staff has reviewed this for consistency with all of our policies uh, and the municipal code um, and found it consistent with the general plan, with the muni code, our design guidelines, um, as well as CEQA and council policy 630 on public outreach. Um, for environmental review, we did an addendum to the prior initial study uh, for the project, for the original project that came in that was approved in 2020. Uh, there were no new significant impacts uh, for the project. Um, the, the significant change between the sort of two documents is obviously post fire, um, the project no longer has a, an impact on a historical uh, resource. Um, so the mitigation measures relative to the house. Um, go away essentially in the CEQA document and so as a result uh, the permit includes a condition uh, requiring the reconstruction of the Graves House on the site. Um, the remaining identified mitigation measures were then included in the mitigation monitoring report. Um, so staff's recommendation is to adopt a resolution uh, adopting the addendum to the ISMND, um, approve an ordinance rezoning the site from RM multifamily, uh, multiple residence zoning district to uh, URPD plan development zoning district, um, adopt a resolution approving subject to conditions, uh, the vesting tentative map, as well as uh, a resolution approving subject to conditions, the plan development permit uh, to allow the development to proceed. And with that, uh, staff's available for questions, and the project's representative, Eric Shainauer, is here to give a presentation.
profits is very interesting. I can tell you the way the economy is going right now, many more developers will be qualifying as nonprofits, and they may come forward uh, for exemption sometime soon. Um, anyhow, good afternoon, Mayor Mahan, members of the council. My name's Eric Shainauer. I represent the applicant on this application. And uh, we were excited finally to bring a project to you, and we are hopeful that you will agree with the staff recommendation as well as the unanimous planning commission to recommend uh, approval of the project. Uh, I just want to bring up a few highlights of the project. Um, first of all, the, um, the site um, is, is a vacant site and blighted site, so the neighborhood, I think, is excited to get it cleaned up and occupied. Also, um, in the bottom photographs here, you can see that there are no sidewalks in front of this site at all. Uh, the street was never built out, no sidewalks, no street trees, anything like that. This project will be implementing uh, those Im improvements. And the uh, the project gives us the opportunity to deliver 14 for sale um, housing units in this part of town where there's limited new for sale product. They're just, the, the area is built out, very little new housing and certainly very little for sale housing. So it creates for sale opportunities for people in the west side of San Jose. And this is the diagram, the layout of the 12 new townhomes plus the reconstructed grave house in the top left corner and the widening of Ranchero Way and the new sidewalks along Ranchero and Mitzi. Let's see. Um, but as staff pointed out, the, really the cornerstone of this project that makes it uh, especially interesting is the, um, the reconstruction of the graves house, which is shown on the top left of this image. The top picture here is the frontage on Mitzi. So we're gonna put the reconstructed historic house facing the public street so everyone can enjoy it and experience it. And as was mentioned, the house, the original historic house was destroyed in fire. Uh, the developer committed to reconstructing it, emulating the original architecture. And I just wanna to go to the final page that shows you all the elevations of the new design because you can see that it it has a very um, complete and authentic appearance for the historic home. And I didn't realize that, oh, here we go. Um, so you can see on all elevations, it will really uh, invoke that original historic character of the, of the house. And so uh, we wanna thank city staff uh, from the planning department, public works, housing, and other departments for reviewing and bringing this forward to hearing. Uh, we also want to thank the um, cooperative um, coordination with the Preservation Action Council San Jose, a very good nonprofit in San Jose, uh, for their coordination and support of, of uh, our efforts to preserve the, the history of the city as best we can considering the circumstance. So we hope that you'll uh, uh, support the project and um, we're available for any questions you might have. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Eric. We'll, uh, we may come back to you. Let's go to public comment first. I have no hands. I think we have one, I believe we have a comment card. Just collect that now. Ready? Yes. Mike Sadegren, Preservation Action Council. I stand before you today in full support of staff's recommendation, the CEQA, the zoning, the subdivision, and the plan. It's beautiful. Um, the reason why we're here is because of a fire and an, a, an update to an original plan that did propose to prominently feature this building that was built in the Civil War era with original growth redwood. So some of that has been lost, but also one of the things that Eric hasn't mentioned is the developer has also agreed to retain some of the materials that were salvaged, that uh, the portico and various uh, elements of the building that are very important and will bring a genuine uh, fabric to, uh, to the rebuild. Um, the community is ready for this. They were ready for it five years ago. That's how long we've been at this as a development effort to nobody's fault, but it has taken a long time to get to this point. 
So it's good for the neighborhood, good for the city, and it is good for the future residents who are gonna live in a place that's special. Um, what did we learn from this? I'd like to put forward three recommendations to prevent the loss of historic buildings on properties like this. One is development code that incentivizes the occupancy of historic buildings through the entitlement process all the way to the end. Two, fast track an amendment to the historic preservation ordinance that includes demolition by ne neglect language that the Historic Landmarks Commission has put forward. And three, add a condition to all projects with historic resources to register and use the San Jose PD STOP program. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope that you will approve this very, very much. Thank you. Okay, a hand went up for Blair. Hi, thank you. Blair Beekman here. Thank you for recognizing my hand. Uh, in looking over this project, uh, thank you for the efforts of uh, Eric Schoenhauer to want to, uh, you know, respect the previous building and, and, and employ uh, you know, uh, design practices uh, in, in his new designs for the, for the future of this project. Um, I think like with the uh, upcoming flea market issue, uh, my question is around, is there any ways to consider how, we, if we have a good start to the process, do you want to better further design practices to, more, to better emulate uh, the previous design of, of uh, the Misty Drive place? And the same with the flea market too area. But with the Misty Drive area, um, it, it was a really beautiful building. And to want to further look into how to develop uh, the future of this building to emulate the previous building, what can be design practices to do that? Do we want to ask those questions? And uh, I think those sort of questions should be asked. And it, it, it makes for a more creative process. And I think uh, an overall uh, more interesting design possibilities for the future. And just to simply uh, name that here, I think can be helpful and important and necessary. And good luck in, in wanting to uh, question uh, even better design from totally good, uh, decent intentions and beginnings that you have uh, to respect the previous building. Uh, good luck in, in future uh, building practices that can, that can further enhance and understand uh, the importance of the previous building and, and how that can be incorporated into the future of the future place. Thanks. Back to council. Great. Thanks, Tony. And I just want to thank the applicants and uh, thank Eric for his presentation and Mike for the work you do and your comments. Um, I'm going to hand it over to the vice mayor in whose district this project would take place. Thank you so much. I too would like to thank the staff, um, the applicant, and the community who's been involved. And the Preservation Action Council, uh, I think that this is sort of an example of how working together can you know, produce some really good outcomes. And there's been uh, some outreach uh, to the neighborhoods, and I want to say how much I appreciated that. And, um, you know, it turned out to be a, a good, I mean, I would have liked to see higher density, but it's, it, it's wonderful, you know, and what you've been able to do with trying to preserve, uh, you know, our history uh, has been good. So with that, I would move staff recommendation. Second. Great. Councilor Cohen. I guess I was wrong about the light coming out automatically. <laughs> okay, um, just, just first of all, I want to thank um, the project developers for the incorporation of the historical site, and I think we need to do more of this around the city where we preserve historical features and build around them as opposed to tearing things down, so I hope to see more of that. Um, just a quick question, I, as you know, you can guess, I'm going to ask about trees. Um, the, the item, it says 33 trees removed, and then I guess it's saying seven on-site replacement trees, is that what the, it calls for, and th those are street trees, is that the proposal? I don't know who's, who's prepared to answer that question. <laughs> yes, that's correct. They're proposing seven replacement trees and approximately 76 replacement trees that would have to be paid in lieu fee. So, so f fees for additional trees around the yes, city? Yes, 775 per And I know these are avoidable, unavoidable consequences of developing sites like this, but I, I'm always uncomfortable when I see the removal of nice, big, mature trees. So 
continue to make my point that let's figure out when we do these developments, in addition to preserving historic elements, let's preserve historic trees as well. Thank you, I'll, but I'll support the motion. Thank you. Appreciate that point. All right, I think we're ready to vote. Mo motion passes unanimously. Great, congratulations to the applicant. Okay, we are on to open forum. Opportunity for members of the public to speak on any city business that was not on today's agenda. Do we have any speakers? Paul? Yes, I'm here. I'm just trying to pull up something right now. I just please let the clock keep ticking. I'll keep talking. This is open forum, so I'd like to be able to make a statement so that the public can hear exactly what happened to me yesterday. Uh, let me get it. I'm pulling it up right here, right now. I was illegally detained yesterday, and I feel it a badge of honor, pride, and dignity that I was able to access the most powerful weapon in the world, a Chicano educated mind. The San Jose Police Department put me in handcuffs as I exited a county government building. I was advocating that more attention be given to Chicanos as a community within the behavioral mental health system. Commiserate with the statement by Dr. Sarah Cody, who stated that racism is a public health issue. Consistent with that statement, I proceeded to remind the board that they had failed miserably in creating policy that would amend, that would make amendment of Dr. Cody's statement. I was arrested as I exited the building. San Jose City Attorney Nort Freeman and Mayor Mahan approved of the arrest, accusing me of falsely committing a crime with zero probable cause in violation of due process and illegal search and seizure. Two county employees witnessed the incident and contacted me within hours and offered to give testimony if subpoenaed because they were disgusted by what they saw. A man who loves his people so much that he continues to advocate for the rights and dignity at immense risk to his life and freedom. The San Jose City Attorney has attempted to arrest me using the power of the San Jose Police Department to force a confrontation in the hopes that it will go wrong and that, will, that the San Jose Police Department will be justifiably committing homicide against me. Be ready for the- Blair followed by Mila. Thanks for the words of Paul. Some we're gonna to have to sort out together. Good luck how we can work on this together. Uh, in the incredible suffering and loss of life the Lahaina fires have caused, it is hopeful to consider the future rebuilding efforts can have a major focus in the traditional practices and human rights of the indigenous population around the Lahaina area and their important role within the Hawaiian Islands. I hope the Lahaina area, the County of Maui and the state of Hawaii will want to consider and possibly begin begin to better follow how the state of California and its local communities are trying to better learn from their own previous mistakes of the past decade and local natural disaster preparedness and planning. From this, we also need to continue the efforts to be more open and clear in how mistakes and planning can be made, both accidentally and on purpose. And we simply need to end the practices of genocide and harm to be considered as the regular ways to develop long-term social planning, community sustainability goals, and how to work towards and achieve our overall better human ideals. Uh, to not cause harm to people in community decision making is part of a love life philosophy from the city of Oakland. It is a philosophy that I hope can become an important part of better reason day to day planning and natural disaster preparedness planning for the future of this country. Interestingly, these decent minded good efforts also help towards more positive economic models and practices as well. Uh, for the past 10 years now, uh, good guidelines, legal precedents, and best practices have been developing in human rights, civil rights, and worker rights ideals at the local level in this country. These good guidelines and legal examples at the local level can help develop a more shared, equal process of public oversight and participatory democracy. All of this can naturally work towards a more future of less overall harm to everyday community persons at the local level. These are concepts of developing skills of good negotiation and dialogue and can offer important steps in how to more easily return to the initial indigenous cultures of this country. These are Mila followed by Mani Manny. Good afternoon, my name is Mila. I'm a new college student born and raised in San Jose and I'm also a member of Silicon Valley Youth Climate Action. 
I'm here today to stress the need to not cut funding to San Jose's Climate Smart program in light of new union negotiations. This program is vital to the future of our city and our planet. Climate Smart staff have organized numerous city programs that benefit the public both in the short term and especially in the long term. My future and the future of all young people is incredibly uncertain. I can't say whether our climate will be stable or whether the next decades of our lives will be dominated by climate change induced floods, wildfires and extreme storms. San Jose has taken the necessary yet remarkable step of establishing the Climate Smart Office. Our leadership encourages other municipalities to take the steps that collectively can lead to a safe future. If we cut funding and thus reduce this office's impact, that will be a step backwards at a time when we need to be racing ahead. We can't afford the many, many impacts of climate change. The way to avoid them is to maintain climate smart funding. Thank you. Manny. Good afternoon. My name is Manny Baca. I am a San Jose resident and a freshman in high school and a member of Silicon Valley Youth Climate Action. I am also here to strongly urge you to reject funding cuts to the vital program Climate Smart San Jose. The Climate Smart program is essential for climate resilience, protection, and justice. I've had direct experience with the program and have found it to be an incredibly effective tool in climate action and community engagement. As a young person, my future and those of millions of other people like me will be directly impacted by the decisions we all make now. I watch with fear as the world is experiencing the effects of climate change right now, more frequent and more deadly heat waves, fires, floods, and droughts. Please do not let the future be an acceleration of these dystopian conditions. San Jose has no chance of meeting our declared goal of net zero emissions by 2030 if this vital program loses its funding and our city would be forfeiting our position as a leader towards a green future. And also, don't say that our city's actions are too small to make a difference. We are the capital of Silicon Valley and pride ourselves in being the most innovative city in the world. We are also a large city with per capita emissions greater than the vast majority of people on Earth. Our policies influence decision makers all over the planet. In short, your actions do make a huge difference. I am not the only one who wants you to preserve full funding for Climate Smart. On June 12, 2023, you received a letter from 109 residents and 10 local organizations urging you to preserve full funding for Climate Smart San Jose in the 23-24 budget. Please demonstrate your commitment to climate resilience, protection, and justice by honoring this request. I will be watching to see what you do. Thank you for your time and consideration. Back to council. Great. Thank you, Tony. And with that, we're adjourned. Have a great afternoon, everyone.